Well, has the Big Bang Theory been disproven? We're going to dive into that. I'm Pastor Josh Barnes. Thanks for joining us here on Point of View. This is the show where we're unashamed to look at political, social, cultural, and theological issues, all from a biblical worldview. We do that because the Bible's true. We know that for a lot of reasons, but probably the biggest reason is because Jesus actually died and actually rose from the dead. And if the Bible's true, and we know that it is, then we can't be right about any issue if we disagree with the Bible. So that's the premise of the show. Yeah, I've read a, uh, just recently came across an article from a man, uh, Barry Setterfield. And uh, his, his claim was that these new images, that you've probably seen them online, these new images from the James Webb Space Telescope um, actually disproves the, the uh, Big Bang model because apparently... I'm going to try to do, give you a layman's explanation. Apparently, there is there is a way that they measure how how old these galaxies are, which I guess makes sense because we're seeing light from a long time ago. And when they're looking so far back, they're they're expecting that uh, about a billion years after the Big Bang, that there's going to be no galaxies or anything in that that age range. But they're finding galaxies as far back as 200 million years after the Big Bang. And they're, they're, they're huge. They're just more numerous and more stars in them and all of these problems, apparently, for the current models. But I am about as far as you can get from an astronomer. <laughs> so, um, so I uh, turned to our good friends at Answers in Genesis and asked if we could have someone come on and actually explain if this is correct and exactly how does this work, explain it to us, and we have the absolute best. I'm joined now by Dr. Danny R. Faulkner, and uh, Dr. Faulkner has a PhD in astronomy. He also has degrees in physics and I think probably a couple other things. Uh, Dr. Faulkner, thank you so much for joining us on Point of View today. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, okay, so you come, you, are you at, at uh, the Answers in Genesis offices right now? Mm -hmm. All right. This is live. We're not live, but recording straight from Answers in Genesis. <laughs> Here we go. Yes. Um, by the way, just before we get started, love the ministry out there. Um, it just we really appreciate all the work you guys do in in diving into these. Give us maybe a summary of of what your thoughts are on this on, on the James Webb Space Telescope and uh, and what the findings are. Um, I think I need to back up and yeah, yeah back up and talk a little, a little bit about the telescope itself. It's been called the replacement for the for the Hubble telescope, uh, but it, in many respects it isn't. It, it's kind of a, it goes beyond it in a different way. The Hubble Space Telescope was dedicated to what we call the optical part of the spectrum, the, what we see with our eyes, and a little bit in the ultraviolet, and a little bit in the infrared. The James Webb Space, Space Telescope doesn't see anything that our eyes sees. It's actually pretty far over into the infrared. And there's a reason for that. They wanted to um, look at the earliest uh, gal galaxies in the earliest times in the universe. And what I mean by that is they're committed to the Big Bang model, which has been the dominant uh, cosmogony for uh, half century. And currently they think the universe began suddenly uh, 13.8 billion years ago in a very hot, dense state. And it's been expanding and cooling ever since. And they thought that uh, stars and galaxies really couldn't get going until about a billion years after the Big Bang. The, um, uh, so so the, the Hubble Space Telescope began finding galaxies earlier than that at great distance, because it, according to the light travel you get, if something is, say, 10 billion light years away, then you're looking at it 10 billion years ago, which would be, what, uh, 3.8 billion years after the Big Bang. So they want to get farther and farther out. Now, without the light out there... With, without making you go down a, a rabbit trail, can you explain um, how they know that they're early? Like, how how is that how is that conclusion come to? Oh, it's based entirely on the distance. Uh, again, if the universe is thirteen point eight billion years old, then if you see something that's ten billion light years away, that's how far light would travel in ten billion years. Then it must be uh, you take thirteen point eight, subtract the ten billion, and that gives you three point eight billion after the Big Bang. It's entirely based upon the assumption of how old the universe is, and you think think you know the distance properly. Okay. And the distance is usually determined from the redshift, which is something that was discovered by Edwin Hubble in 1929. He, people say he discovered the expansion of the universe. What he really discovered was that there's a correlation between distance and redshift, redshift being how far 
the spectrum is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, towards longer wavelengths. It's uh, something like, but not really the same as a Doppler shift. We use uh, Doppler shift to measure velocities of uh, raindrops in storms, uh, cars that are speeding, all those kind of aircraft, all sorts of things. So it's a pretty well proven technology. So we measure these redshifts. And what he found was that the greater the distance a galaxy has, the, the more redshift it has, which is consistent with the universe expanding. So he found the correlation. The interpretation is that the universe is expanding. So the problem is when you get really far out there, not only are the galaxies very faint because light drops off uh, with increasing distance at a very quick rate, the light that we're most interested in, which is normally in the visible part of the spectrum, is red shifted way over into the infrared. And so if you want to see them uh, in the most interesting part of the spectrum, the part we really, we really want to talk about and study, you have to build an infrared telescope and you can't do that from the ground because water vapor absorbs virtually all the infrared. So you have to put it up in space, which is why it's in space. It's a very big, big telescope, much bigger than the Hubble. So there were two primary objectives uh, that the, the uh, James Webb telescope was uh, built and designed as built for. And one of them is to determine the very early structure uh, of these galaxies at the first uh, half billion years or so. And again, remember the expectation was you weren't supposed to see uh, galaxies, at least not very many of them, in the first uh, half billion years or, or even more. And um, so far, they've not actually measured spectra. They have to look at the colors that they're getting to figure out uh, roughly how far away they are. Uh, they're they're going to come back later and try to get that more accurately. But right now, they're working off the colors. And they're getting now what they're, uh, the last, I, I wrote an article on this recently on our website at answersandgenesis.org about this. And they were arguing that they're now seeing galaxies only uh, 200 million years after the Big Bang. And that's a real problem because 10 years ago, nobody would have predicted that. They would have said, no, you couldn't have had galaxies that, that early on. And those galaxies are fully formed. Uh, they've got structure. They look very similar to nearby galaxies. There are some systematic differences uh, slight differences, but not great differences. But they were expecting that first stars would form, and it'd take a while for that to happen. And then stars would kind of amalgamate and form small galaxies, and then small galaxies would amalgamate with other galaxies, form bigger galaxies. And so it's a kind of bottom up hierarchy where you start with stars and work your way to larger and larger structures. And um, that's been totally ripped up in the, in the last month or two because uh, what they're finding is that the uh, these galaxies seem to be uh, fully formed and they hope to keep pushing it back farther and farther and farther. So uh, some creationists have been saying that the Big Bang model is disproved and I guess uh, that's technically true, but what's gonna happen is they're going to refigure the, the Big Bang model. Uh, this, so they're just going to add more history. years to it? Is that what, uh, you know? They're no, they're just going to change how they think the early universe developed. The Big Bang happens, and then the question now comes, how did stars and galaxies form? And um, what they do, every time that the Big Bang model runs into problems that it has over the past half century, they always just change the model around uh, to make it fit what they now observe. And uh, we can come back a little later on what I think that means philosophically of dealing with the philosophy of science. So... That what, people are saying, well, it's the death knell of the Big Bang. Well, I've heard that kind of story before. Uh, it's the death knell of this particular version of the Big Bang model. I, I'm confident that what's going to happen is that they're just going to come up with a different Big Bang model that's consistent with what they're observing. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I'd like to explore with you in, in a few moments here uh, the, the ramifications of that vis-a-vis -vis philosophy of science, because I think that's very important. Uh, another thing that's concerned me, and I've been talking about this off and on for years, is uh, the Big Bang says that the universe began with hydrogen and helium, a little bit of lithium and really nothing else. So the oxygen we breathe, the nitrogen we breathe, the carbon uh, that's you know basis of all life, the iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, all of those things, none of them came from the original Big Bang. They were all forged inside of stars. The stars do nucleosynthesis, uh, fusing together smaller nuclei to make bigger nuclei. Uh, of, of atoms. So you, you, you come up with carbon, then you build oxygen, and you build uh, nitrogen and all those things, uh, uh, progressively more and more heavy, heavier, heavier elements um, as time goes by. But that takes time. It takes multiple generations of stars to do that. Uh, astronomers call that chemical enrichment. So you would expect that the most distant uh, things you see in the universe should be 
pretty void of any heavy elements. Well, they have taken some spectra of those distant objects and they're finding neon and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. So, so it's there. Wow. Uh, and where was the time? It seems like time was really sped up or something. And they're going to have to change that as well. And there's some questions about the earlier stars uh, in general being uh, lacking the heavier elements. They, they should actually be fainter, but we're finding very bright stars. I think they're just going to argue that the first generations of stars, for whatever reason, were very massive stars. And that's part of the paradigm they're going to, they're going to go to now. Um, now, if you ask we creationists, special creationists, what we would expect, and I was talking about this again before the James Webb Space Telescope. I wish I would have talked about it more explicitly now, but uh, we expect it to be galaxies all the way back. The reason for that is that uh, we believe that God made the galaxies on day four when he made the astronomical bodies. At the end of day four, it says that God saw that it was good. At the end of day six, it says God proclaimed over the entire creation it was very good. And that goodness gets across the idea of completeness, that uh, what God had created is now fully functioning. Uh, you know, at the very beginning of the creation week, in, in verse two it's, uh, of Genesis 1, it says that that uh, what, what was there was uh, unfilled and unformed. It says... Uh, um, it wasn't say in the King James uh, void without uh, and, and empty, um, without form and, and empty. Without That's what it's void, void, yeah. void and without without form. And uh, I think it's better better getting across by being unfilled and unformed. But then the, the end of the creation week, it's formed and it's filled. You know, God spent all six days shaping and forming that initial creation to get what it is at the end of the creation week. And so um, we're not going to be seeing a bunch of evolution of galaxies and stars as we go to great distances. We are going to see galaxies because that's the way God made it. Unless at great distance we get a peek at what was going on, on uh, during creation week. I wouldn't, I, I don't think that will happen, but, you know, there are some people suggest that could happen. So yeah. um, that's well, our, our expectation. And what we're finding is the, the data so far, the observations so far are consistent with what we creationists expected all along. So we're, we're very happy. We're very excited about what we're seeing because it's exactly what we predicted would happen. Yeah. Well, that's great. One of the things that really st uh, stood out to me about the article that I read, um, and again, I, I couldn't really fully understand the whole thing, but one of the conclusions uh, that the gentleman came to was that it appears, he says, that he, it appears that the cosmos started off in an almost pristine condition and then faded with time rather than start, starting off with nothing and then so slowly evolved over time. Yep. And yep. I think that, would that be a fair conclusion to come to from what we're seeing from the James Webb? I, 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 I think so, yeah, that'd be a very fair fair layman, layman summation of what he said, yeah. And that's very consistent, of course, with, yeah. <laughs> with creation. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems <laughs> like what we're finding is gonna have to make evolutionists and and uh, even, even, even theistic evolutionists have to re, redo their models, but it doesn't seem to change a young earth creationist model, does it? No, we, we, we have changed our models from time to time, but this one isn't at this point, not, not cause us to change. Yeah. And you mentioned the change of the models and I wanted, I alluded to that. I want to get back right. to that. Yeah. The, um, you know, there was a, a guy named Claudius Ptolemy in the early second century AD, uh, put together this, this theory of, of motion of the planets in the sun and the moon. The uh, stars remain relatively fixed. They don't change their positions relative to one another. The stars change throughout the night yeah, th that you see, and also the stars change from season to season, but they come back tomorrow night, they come back next year. So the uh, constellations we look at are pretty much what people saw thousands of years ago. Joe mentions Orion. I look at Orion, I'm seeing the same thing he saw. But then you get uh, seven objects that move with respect to the stars. The uh, moon takes once a, once a month to go through the stars. The sun ta uh, takes, that's due to its orbit around the Earth, of course, and the sun takes a year to go through the stars, and that's due to our orbit around the sun. And then you get the five naked eye planets. They look like bright stars. They're Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They go traveling along, and they change direction and move back and forth. It's because of their motion around the sun, and our motion around the sun gets combined with this back and forth motion. And it defied explanation until a guy named Ptolemy, as I mentioned, came up with this model where you have the planets moving in a circle like this, with the Earth kind of near the center, but then that circle, uh, well, actually the, the planet's moving on a small circle, and then it's on a larger circle that moves around the, around the Earth roughly. So you get this very complicated spiraling motion that takes place. And uh, it turns out it worked pretty well to describe motion. It became very popular and was dogma for 15 centuries. The um, 
the strength of the Ptolemaic model was that whenever there was a discrepancy between observations and, and the theory, you could always add more little, little epicycles, little tiny circles. <laughs> so by the time you get to around 1600, there, you, you went from about a dozen epicycles to well over 100 epicycles just to make it fit. So I, tell, I would tell people, my students, and I used to teach, and, my, and anybody who listened to me when I talk about it, the strength of the Ptolemaic models, it could be, it could be uh, indefinitely improved upon with, with more adjustments being made to fit the data. But the, the downfall or the, or the shortcoming or the failure of the, of, the, of the Ptolemaic model was that it could be continually modified to fit new data <laughs> because after a while it became a very complicated model and people applied what's called Occam's razor. You know, the, the idea, the, the simplest explanation is probably the correct one. And people looked at that and realized this is crazy. This model has just gotten too complicated. Ultimately, you can't falsify that model either. You know, in science, we're always talking about uh, disproving ideas. If, if you can't disprove an idea, then it gives you confidence it's probably true. It's kind of a backward way of looking at it, but that's the way science works because we're working with inductive reasoning for the most part, and you don't prove things like you do in mathematics or deductive reasoning. So we, we try to our best to disprove ideas, and if we can't disprove them, then we have confidence they're probably true. Um, so science changes over the years, and when you come to the Ptolemaic model, it could not be falsified, it could not be disproved. So it really wasn't a good a good theory. A theory explains anything and everything really isn't a good theory at all in science. Yeah. And I fear that the Big Bang model has become that because uh, Big Bang model has been around uh, not quite as long as I have. I was uh, in school growing up when it became widely accepted. So most of my life, most of my experience has been based on the Big Bang model, but it's changed remarkably over the years. The expansion rate has changed and hence the age of the universe. It used to be 18 to billion years, uh, 18 to 20 billion years. Now it's 13.8 billion years plus or minus 1%. The, um, Let's see, they've added uh, dark matter and dark energy. Those weren't really considered 30 years ago. They've added string theory. They've added all sorts of other things, and they just change things around. Um, I remember back uh, 30, a little over 30 years ago, the COBE experiment was looking at the cosmic microwave background. Uh, that's a relic uh, a microwave radiation coming from every direction in space from a period of a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, supposedly. Hmm. And it's... Um, they were looking for temperature fluctuations that were necessary to explain galactic structure, how galaxies formed in the first place, and be a little warmer and cooler areas imprinted upon that. And they predicted variations of one part in 10,000 in the temperature. The temperature around 3 Kelvin, which is really, really cold. And what they found was uh, the prediction was off by a factor of 10. Uh, it's uh, one part in 100,000, not one part in 10,000. Wow. So what did they do? Well, they just went back and they redid the theory to match the data. And then they claimed that the predictions beautifully matched the, matched the theory, uh, matched the observations. I said, wait a minute, that, that's not true. What you, you found out the model, the model didn't work. The theory was wrong by a factor of 10. And so you just redid the theory and then, but don't tell me that, that the theory predicted it didn't. The theory uh, predicted it after the fact, but that's just fitting it to the data. And I think the same thing is going to happen here. Uh, they're going to say, oops, our model was disproved, but let's just change the model a bit to make it fit. And that's what they're going to end up doing. And they, they've done it repeatedly over the last uh, 50, 50 years. And um, so it's starting to me, uh, the Big Bang model is resembling the, uh, the Ptolemaic model. You just keep changing it to make it fit. And as I said before, a theory that explains anything and everything doesn't, doesn't explain anything because it can't be disproved. And I think it's, it's not even really quali qualifying as a scientific model then anymore. Yeah. If, if there, if every time something's disproved, you just change it and it's not disproved anymore, you're right. It's not falsifiable. It can't, it can't be a viable, um, a viable theory that, that really applies to more than science. I mean, that applies to a lot of different yeah. areas of, of debate and, and other sort of other sort of logic. But, um, uh, uh, now let's take, if, if, if we can, let's take the data that we're seeing and let's see how it fits with the young earth creationist model. Because I know a lot of people, this is one, of, one thing that a lot of people came to me and said, hey, look, we're seeing back billions of years into the past, which means that the universe has to be billions of years old. And honestly, I, I um, tried to answer that, being a young earth creationist myself, 
But that's something I, I feel like I want to pass on to you. How, how do you answer that? Does this mean that the universe is billions of years old since, you know, light has to travel billions of years to get here from these stars? Well, I'll admit that that's the most straightforward interpretation of the data. Uh, I mean, if I were going to make an argument for billions of years, I would go there every time. However, I believe scripture makes it very clear the universe is quite young. I don't know exactly how young, but I think on the order of a little over 6,000 years. Um, you know, we, we call this the light travel time problem. We, we look out and we can we can see, uh, I can see with my naked eye on a dark, clear night this time of year, uh, the, Milky, uh, the uh, Andromeda galaxy. And it's uh, about two, two and a half million light years away from us. And so we will ask, how can you see such a distant object if the, if the, if the world is only thousands of years old? We don't worry about stars nearby because that's not really a problem, you see, because uh, we don't really see any stars that are farther away than 6,000 light years anyway. But you know what? Uh, we, 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 kind of, we kind of shortchange Adam because Adam had a light travel time problem. He, uh, uh, when, when he looked up on uh, the end of, nights, the, the, of night, the day six, and the night fell beginning of day seven, and the uh, first time he looked up in the night sky, what did he see? Well, stars. I think he saw stars, yeah. Even though the stars were only made on day four, that's only two days earlier, and the nearest star outside the sun is more than four light years away. I don't think, you know, he waited four years and four months and then, bink, there's one star, and he waited another 10 years, there's another star. I think he saw pretty much what we see. And the reason why I say that is because uh, the stars were given certain functions and purposes on day four when God made them. And remember that goodness I talked about, the goodness talks about complete, completeness and fulfillment. Uh, they were fulfilling their functions that they had, and they could not fulfill those functions if they were not visible. So Adam had a light travel time problem, didn't he? Uh, we worry, we obsess over the most distant things in the universe, but actually he had a difficult time seeing close, nearby things, not things in the solar system, but things a few light years away from us. How did, did he do that? I think if we can answer his, solve his little problem, we can probably solve our little problem too. And I, and I note two things about the creation week. Many times we think everything in the creation week was ex nihilo, that is made out of nothing. Initially, the creation was that done that way, and several things during the creation week were done that way, but most of the things were not. Uh, God made man out of the dust of the ground. Later on, we see he made the uh, land animals and the birds out of the dust of the ground. Um, he caused the plants to grow out of the, the ground on day three. They, they just didn't poof appear like that. And furthermore, uh, the, we also sometimes assume that it's all instantaneous. Poof, these, the whale appears. Poof, this tree appears. And that's not what it says. Uh, it, he used a lot of process. Even the making of Adam was a process coming out of the ground. It, it took a little bit of time. So I see a lot of process taking place. And it, it's working towards that fulfillment. The plants had to grow up and become mature very rapidly because we know from the end of the chapter, everything Every man, uh, every uh, the man and every beast ate vegetable matter. They didn't eat meat, and so they had to be able to eat the uh, uh, the fruit of those plants, and they had to be mature in order to do that. You couldn't do it any other way. So, um, I think in similar manner on day four, God rapidly matured that light, as it were. He brought the light to the earth. So when I look at the Andromeda galaxy, I believe it's over 2 million light years away, but I don't think that light's been traveling nearly that long. I think it's been traveling something closer to 6,000 years. It's a miracle. Many of my um, physics and astronomy colleagues uh, in, in the creation movement, they, they want to invoke a, a physical explanation based on general relativity or something. I think that's wrong. I think we should be doing it, realizing that everything else in the creation week was miraculous. Why would that not be miraculous too? Interesting. And that's, so it's that's, it's about maturity. If if God can rapidly mature living animals and living beings and living plants, He can also rapidly mature a light tra yeah. tra traveling from a star. And, it, and it's a little different from mature creation. Uh, Henry Morris was very fond of what we call mature creation or creation of light and transit. He said he just created the mature, and I said no. He matured them rapidly. He went through a process to rapidly mature them. So it's a little different explanation from his, but uh, I think that's that's how how this is done. I might, not, might want to add out to you, add to you here that the uh, Big Bang model has a light travel problem too. A lot of people don't know that. It's called a horizon problem. I remember I mentioned the cosmic microwave background. It's called CMB for short. It's about a three three Kelvin microwave background coming from every direction in space. It was discovered in the mid 1960s and was taken as the uh, first evidence and the big proof of the Big Bang. And what it means is you're looking off in this direction, and you will see. 
uh, a radiation field with a little under three Kelvin temperature, like 2.73 something, something, something temperature. We can measure it to like five significant figures or even better than probably yeah, at least five now. And then you look off in this direction, diametrically opposite, and you see exactly the same temperature. And it doesn't matter which direction you go, this way and that way, this way and that way, you see precisely the same temperature and diametrically opposite things. Now, it's a principle in physics that two things will come into what we call thermal equilibrium, or if you will, the same temperature, only if they've had the opportunity to exchange heat through conduction, convection, or in this case, radiation. But if we're sitting here and we're receiving radiation from 13.8 billion light years coming this way from point A, and we're receiving radiation from point B, 13.8 billion light years away, radiation from point A has never reached point B, and radiation from point B has never reached point A, has it? It's just getting to where we are in the midpoint. So why are they the same temperature? <laughs> it's a mystery why the universe has the same temperature throughout. And I realized this problem in the 1970s. It was about 40 years ago in the 1980s that Alan Guth first proposed what we call cosmic inflation. The idea when the Big Bang happens, it's rapidly expanding. But then about 10 to the minus 34 seconds or so after the Big Bang, think about that, 10 to the minus 34 seconds. It's point followed by you know 30, 30, 33 zeros and a one, um, the universe starts expanding at many orders of magnitude faster than the speed of light. The, the, the universe expands really, really fast, far faster than light. And then about 10 to the minus 32 seconds, it abruptly stops doing that and goes back to normal expansion. And the idea is before the, 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 this hyper expansion took place, the universe came into thermal equilibrium. That is the same temperature. And then when it hyperinflated like this, it uh, took the universe out of thermal contact with much of itself, and it's only slowly re redeveloping that. So they had a light travel time problem. How did the light from, the, from over here get over there? And they solve it by invoking cosmic inflation. Now, it's been around for 40 years. Do you know how much evidence there is of cosmic inflation? None. None. I'm guessing. That's exactly right. <laughs> and to me, I mean, if you have no evidence for, for a process, past process, then it suggests that, well, maybe it was a miracle. <laughs> I mean, they, yeah. they get on our case because they say, well, you're just invoking a miracle. Well, so are you. <laughs> Give me a physical explanation, some evidence that this actually happened, and they can produce neither. So consequently, they're invoking a miracle, so they choose not to call it a miracle. I'm, I'm not ashamed to call it a miracle because it's consistent with what I'm doing. They can't invoke a miracle because, well, they're committed to naturalism, so they have to make up this cockeyed idea about it. So uh, make no mistake about it, the Big Bang people, they have a light travel time problem too. Yeah. This, this has all been so educational and so helpful. Uh, Dr. Faulkner, thank you so much for, for coming on and explaining this. And I probably will have, after I think through this whole topic, like a whole list of more questions to ask you the next time we have you on, because we'll have to have you back sometime. Thank you oh, so much been for so your much experience. Fun. I'd uh, been so much fun. I'd love to do it again. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. And follow The Bible Explained on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Bible Explained. I really appreciate the support. Also, I want to remind you that the entire Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that all men are sinners and that we must pay for our sin against God for eternity in hell. That's definitely the bad news. But you see, the Bible is all about this one thing, the good news that Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin on the cross. Since your sin has been paid for by Christ, all that is left for you to do is to turn from your sin and accept his salvation by faith. If you've never accepted this gift of God by faith, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a private message on Facebook and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.